Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for braving the rain to come out for a discussion with one of the most intelligent and entertaining generals in the Army, uh, H.R. McMaster. Uh, he, he needs no introduction, but, uh, but I have to do it anyway. So he's had an extremely distinguished career uh, as a combat leader. He was a troop commander in the first Gulf War and then returned there as a regimental commander 15 years later to Iraq, um, spent some more time in Iraq, advising General Petraeus as MNFI commander, um, had the director of the chairman's advisory group at Central Command, uh, made his way to Training Doctrine Command in 2012, first as the commander at the uh, Maneuver Center of Excellence down at Fort Benning, and then uh, more recently as the director of the Army Capabilities and Integration Center and the deputy uh, commanding general of TRADOC for futures. So General McMaster has uh, graciously offered to come talk to us today about the, the Army operating con concept, Army futures, uh, and any other topic we may choose to throw at him. So uh, if people could turn off their cell phones, the, the ringers, that would be appreciated. And when we'll try to get to Q&A quickly if we can. And so if people, when we get to that point, can wait for the mic um, and identify themselves and be brief, it would be much appreciated. So. Um, Sir, thanks. Thanks, thanks for coming. Over to you. Martin, thanks. And it's, it's a real privilege to be here with you and, and at CSIS. And I think all of us understand the importance of, in a democracy, that, that uh, the Army and the armed forces in general stay connected with the people in whose name we fight. And, uh, and CSIS has had a leading role in doing that, helping us stay connected to the people in, in whose name we fight. And of course, you know, a lot of discussions about future force development tend to revolve around resources and how, you know, and so forth. And of course, in a democracy, you, you get the military that the people are willing to pay for. So it's important for us to, to be able to explain, really, how, how we see as professional officers the, the, uh, the problem of future armed conflict and, and how Army forces have to operate as part of joint, what we're calling now interorganizational, you know, civil military teams and multinational teams to accomplish the mission in future armed conflict. And we just finished in TRADOC a long effort to develop what we're calling the Army Operating Concept. And I just encourage everybody, please look it up online. It's a real page turner, perfect holiday reading. Take it to the ski slopes with you it's, and so stocking forth. Stocking stuffer. <laughs> it's a stocking stuffer as well. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and really what, what that document aims to do is to lay a, a conceptual foundation for Army modernization and force development. And it's a beginning point, it's not an end point. So a couple significant things about this document, I think, that are, that are worth uh, emphasizing and might provide some material for the question and answer session. The first of these is that in the development of this sort of idealized vision of, of, of future armed conflict, we considered both continuity and change. And we concluded in our work that we tend to get in, in trouble you know, if we neglect continuities in the nature of war. And we considered in, in particular four key continuities in the nature of war and their implications for this Army operating concept. The first of these is that war is an extension of politics. OK, everybody knows that, right? You like that commercial? Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, but, the, uh, but really, what is the implication of that? The implication is that you fight and you commit military forces across the range of military operations to achieve sustainable political outcomes consistent with your vital interests. So what are the implications for us? Well, that, what that means is we have to be able to, to fight to defeat enemy organizations and establish security and secure populations and so forth. But we have to also be able to consolidate gains. We have to consolidate gains, usually politically, to get to that sustainable political outcome. So a further implication is, well, we just, the Army doesn't do that on its own, right? Of course not. You know, we have to work with multiple partners as part of the joint force. And we have to be able to integrate civil military teams. So one of the implications for our, our concept is that the Army has to provide foundational capabilities to the joint force. And these are capabilities that the Army provides every day across the globe. And this is theater logistics capability and intelligence capabilities and, and uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities and engineering capabilities. And so that gives us a foundation uh, that, that allows the joint force to be able to respond uh, to, uh, to resolve crisis, shape security in, environments. But we have to act with, uh, operate with a broader range of partners, and that's multinational partners. Of course, we see that clearly today where we're fighting people who really are the enemies of all civilized people, right? And so 
our Army has to provide those foundational capabilities to multinational forces to integrate their efforts and, and help bring sort of coherence to chaotic and, uh, and, and difficult problem sets, yeah, as we're doing in Liberia, you know, for example, today with, with Ebola, as, as we are uh, we're doing in, in Iraq uh, to deal with that situation, to provide headquarters capability to integrate efforts of a multinational team, of course, with the Iraqis uh, being the most important member of that multinational team. And so what we're saying, the concept is that we can't just project military power, right? We need to be able to project national power, national power to, to be able to, to, to deal with these complex situations. And that doesn't mean the Army does it all. It may, oftentimes means the Army's in a supporting role to others who have a lead role. But that's what's important for Army forces and land forces in general to, for, because, because of that continuity in war, that war is, is waged to, to, for that sustainable political outcome. The other key continuity that we considered is that, is that war is profoundly human. And, and we neglect that at our peril because we have to understand that to understand why people fight. What are the causes of violence? What is driving violence? And people fight essentially really for the same reasons Thucydides identified 2,500 years ago, fear, honor, and interest. And so if you don't understand what's driving conflicts, oftentimes at a very local level that's taken advantage of by people at, you know, at higher levels, national or, or, or uh, regional levels, uh, then you're, you, can, you really can only treat the symptoms, right? The symptoms of what is causing this violence. So the implication for us in the, in the concept is that we have to be able to develop situational understanding as Army forces, oftentimes in close contact with enemies and, 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 uh, and with civilian populations, and develop that understanding, kind of push that upward so we understand what is really driving the violence at, the, at that local level. The third, the third continuity that we considered is wars uncertainty. And you know, we, we recognize that you know, previous concept works, especially in the late 1990s, had assumed that advances in, in technology, information technology, communication technology, computing power, automated decision-making tools, and so forth, had shifted war, the assumption was, from the realm of uncertainty into the realm of certainty. And so we made a series of, I think, flawed assumptions that were actually building vulnerabilities uh, into our joint force in the late 1990s and up to, to the, the mass murder attacks on our country on September 11th. And I think now we recognize, based on recent experiences and, and, and correctives to that sort of thinking, that, that war will remain fundamentally uncertain uh, because, because of, of enemy countermeasures to these capabilities, traditional countermeasures that we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, dispersion, concealment, intermingling with civilian populations, deception. And, but fundamentally, war will remain uncertain because of the complexity associated with the political and human dimension of war. But also, it will remain uncertain because of continuous interaction with determined enemies. And so in, in, the, in this document, we really emphasize the need not to just, for Army forces, we're not saying as much are just going to be decisive in sort of short duration campaigns. But we have to really work hard to seize, retain, and exploit the initiative uh, or, over the enemy. And recognizing that the enemy, enemies oftentimes, have a say in the, in the future course of, of events. And then the final continuity that we considered is a war is a contest of wills. And so it's, it's important for us really to understand how we operate on the physical battleground, but what effects also we're having on the battleground of perception and information. Uh, also to understand really the demands on soldiers associated with operating uh, in environments of persistent danger and, uh, in, and environments of uncertainty and, and complexity. So in this concept, we really emphasize developing resilient soldiers and cohesive teams that are capable of operating in these environments of persistent danger and, and, and complexity. And so what we emphasize is, is not just any kind of just a new technology that we want to apply into the, into the Army, but we recognize that our competitive advantage in the complex land environment comes from combinations of skilled soldiers and teams with, with technology. It comes from how you combine different capabilities, again, to seize, retain, and exploit the initiative over the enemy. So we, we considered continuity, and we also considered change. I mean, the old the historian Carl Becker in the 1920s said, you know, the memory of, of the past and the anticipation of the future have to walk hand in hand in a happy way. So what do we consider when we're thinking about changes in the environment? Well, we first of all, we considered threats, enemies, and adversaries right, in, in the operating environment. And we, took a look at what the trends are. And I think there are some significant ones that we have to make sure we continue to put front and center, many of which were highlighted in the, in the essay in that volume, that we have to really deal with 
with state-based threats, right? And we see some state-based threats that are growing. I mean, we've seen in recent, even in just the most recent months, uh, Russia using combinations of, of conventional and unconventional land forces to reassert its power on the Eurasian landmass, for example. So state-based threats are important. Obviously, North Korea is another state-based threat to be concerned about. And then, of course, Destruction, right? The, the access to, uh, to to very destructive weapons and, and technological capabilities by these non-state uh, these non-state actors, and of course we have to consider you know how they combine in these dynamic combinations of conventional and unconventional threats, so-called hybrid threats. Use hybrid strategies, and and of course you see I think Iranians use of proxies uh, throughout the Greater Middle East and the you know, sort of Hezbollah as a model uh, of of this kind of a hybrid threat that has uh, state sponsorship. Uh, and then also has uh, has capabilities provided to it uh, that, that give us give it uh, some some tremendous military potential. The other things, as we mentioned, as we looked at as we looked at uh, in, in the concept, as we looked at threats, enemies, and adversaries, we said, okay, what are what are our threats, enemies, and adversaries doing? concealment and intermingling with civilian populations. Uh, but increasingly, they, they're not just evading those capabilities, but they're taking actions to disrupt them, which is the second thing we see our enemies doing, with integrating new technologies that disrupt our communications capability, disrupt our, our precision strike capabilities. And these are sort of cyber attack type capabilities, electromagnetic uh, capabilities, uh, as well as GPS jamming and, and so forth. And then increasingly, and I think what a lot of recent work here in Washington is highlighted, is that our enemies are doing a third thing, which is emulating some of our capabilities. And this has a lot to do you know, with the ease of technology transfer. And, and it's important for us, I think, to recognize that the most transferable advantage, differential advantage that we have in defense is technology to our enemies. And of course, we know that China has been engaged uh, in the largest threat of intellectual property in, in history. So, so what, what are the implications for us of that is, is important for us to consider in the, in the concept. And, and finally, we see enemies expanding, expanding into other battlegrounds. And these are battlegrounds of perception and information, battlegrounds of political subversion, the connection of these enemy organizations to transnational organized crime networks. And so for us to be effective, we have to compete in all of these contested spaces, the physical space, but also the information space. Also, uh, we see implications for a greater integration of, of of military efforts uh, with law enforcement, you know, for example, and, and uh, counter threat finance actions and so forth as we go against these networks in a more holistic way. So that's, that's what we looked at in terms of changes is threats, enemies, adversaries in the operating environment. Uh, we, looked, uh, we looked very heavily at the, at the so-called anti-access area denial capabilities. Uh, and we think that, uh, that, that we applaud the great work that's going on uh, in air sea battle, for example, to deal with this threat. And we, we feel that Army forces play a vital role uh, in, in that, in, against that kind of threat by being able to assure access. And so in, the, in our document, we, we, uh, we introduce the terms of expeditionary maneuver and joint combined arms operations. And that's the ability to deploy into austere environments with formations that have the pr appropriate balance of mobility, protection, and firepower, combined arms capability, access to joint capabilities to achieve surprise, strike enemies from an unexpected direction, conduct effective reconnaissance to identify these type of, of capabilities, and then have the offensive power you know, to destroy those capabilities, as well as the ability to establish control of that terrain to deny its use to the enemy. And, and of course, there are all sorts of historical analogies that are relevant to this. If you think about the V1 and V2 threat to London in World War II, if you think about really what it took to address the long-range rocket threat out of southern Lebanon in 2006, for that matter, the threat to Israel out of the Western Desert in Iraq in 1991, uh, the, the threat coming out of Gaza, you know, for example. So, so it takes a joint force, right? American military power is joint power. 
And so what we emphasize in this document is Army forces in context of joint operations to deal with these, to deal with these sorts of, of capabilities. The, the second key th area of change that we look at, it, it looked at is, 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 uh, is what's changing in terms of missions, assigned missions, uh, and then what we anticipate missions will be based on, the, on these emerging threats and so forth. And what this document emphasizes, maybe more than, than previous sort of conceptual documents for future force development, is the Army's efforts across the range of military operations, from preventing conflict, shaping security environments, and then winning against determined and, and adaptive and capable en en enemies. And so what this has a lot to do with is those foundational capabilities that I, that I mentioned, but it's also the need, again, to integrate efforts of multiple partners uh, and to provide the, the President and, and the Secretary of Defense and combatant commanders in particular with multiple options. What are the options that Army forces provide in the area of preventing conflict and shaping security environments and winning? And in this area in particular, we emphasize, as Marin did in, in her essay, the, the vital role that land forces play in deterring conflict. I think oftentimes we, uh, we, we forget how important it is uh, for land forces to be part of, of, of our ability to deter, because it really is that what Thomas Schelling called the brute force option, the ability to impose your will on an enemy, that makes actions short of, of, of the commitment of, of land forces more effective. And these are in particular our tremendous joint forces standoff capabilities and precision strike capabilities. Standoff capabilities, I think we recognize, leave the future decisions largely in the hands of your, of your enemy. And it's land forces that can really compel outcomes, and that's an important contribution to the, to the joint force. So in missions, we took a, a broad look across prevent, shape, and, and, and win. The third area that we consider in terms of change was technology, how technology is changing and what, what that can afford us in terms of, of new capabilities. We're interested in particular in, in autonomous and semi-autonomous systems, obviously a tremendous proliferation of those across the last 13, 14 years of war. How do we integrate them more effectively to do certain things for our force, to help us make contact with the enemy under favorable conditions? you know, to, to, uh, to, uh, to integrate all arms more effectively into, into the fight, to be able to gain and maintain contact with enemy forces, to provide security across wide areas, to assist us logistically so we can sustain freedom of movement and action at the end of extended and contested lines of communications in, in austere environments. So, so we're excited about the integration of those technologies, and we're also excited about the integration of power and energy technologies uh, that we think can help us really reduce the size of formations without reducing the capability of those formations through a, a reduction in logistics demand. And we're, we're also emphasizing really the appropriate balance across all of our formations of mobility, protection, and firepower. Uh, recent, uh, recent operations in Iraq and Afghanistan have understandably biased our efforts in favor of protection. How do we uh, protect soldiers and give them mobility and protect them against this, in particular the roadside bomb and, and IED threat? What's happened, though, is as we've layered more and more on of our, our vehicles, their power ratio hasn't gone up, so we're lo losing a little bit of mobility, and we're seeing our adversaries upgun their vehicles. So what we, we want to do is make sure we maintain our differential advantage as a, as a combined arms team in close combat with the enemy, with maybe investments in increased lethality uh, and, and, uh, and mobility across, across our force. And then, of course, we're looking at, at technologies that help us with the, the ballistic missile threat, and in particular, technologies that will help us do something different that we highlight in the concept, which is do something slightly differently, which is to project power from land into the, the air, maritime, space, and cyber domains. And this would be Army forces supporting the joint force by assisting the joint force in maintaining freedom of movement and action in those domains and restricting the use of those domains uh, to, the, to our enemies. And so, of course, this is, and nothing is really very much, un, I mean, completely unprecedented. <laughs> I could say as a historian, you know, so, I mean, this is, a, this is a role that's analogous to, you know, coastal artillery roles, for example, and so forth. And there's been a lot of great work that's done, done, uh, done been, that's been done here in CSBA and, and, uh, and, and, and DOD on this. And so we're, we're, we're looking forward to continue to work with the joint force on this as well. And then the final area that we, we looked at is, is what do we see happening in the, in, in the world today, right? What are the lessons we've learned? You know, we, 
we tend to learn with a great deal of enthusiasm, but not sometimes in a very organized way, right? So what have we learned from our own experience over 13 years of war? But what have, what have we learned from other, other, other recent conflicts? And you know, the, whole, the Greek saying of that the way to consider the future is to walk backwards into the future, right? Looking, looking backward into the side to understand better. So what we've introduced to help us learn more effectively is we've introduced a framework for learning called the War Fighting Challenges. And those are in, the, in, the, uh, in Annex B of the Army Operating Concept. But you know, we, we recognize that what Sir Michael Howard said is you're never gonna get war exactly right. The key is to not be so far off the mark that you can't adjust to the real demands of conflict once they reveal themselves to you. So the best way, I think, to make sure that you're not too far off the mark is to is just ask the right questions. So these are 20 first order questions, the answers to which will improve current and future force combat effectiveness. And the key is we need to work with CSIS, we need to work with, uh, with, our, with uh, the joint force, we need to work with multinational partners and our allies in a focused, sustained, and collaborative way on developing interim solutions to these questions. And, and we're, we're able to do that, I think, effectively now. We're, make, we're, we're conducting estimates, uh, completing them for each of these areas, and we talk more about these if you'd like, and developing interim solutions. And the idea is that these will be integrated solutions that will have doctrinal and organizational and training and leader development solutions and material solutions. So it's not that we're gonna pursue a thing or a specific technology to solve this problem. Again, we're emphasizing how we combine people with advanced technology to maintain our differential advantage uh, over, over our enemies. And what this framework will do is allow us to have a campaign of learning. It's called Force 2025. And that's all of our learning activities from experimentation to our big annual war game uh, in our army. And these are questions we'll bring into, uh, into joint uh, war gaming and experimentation. And you know, it's what we're doing every day and what we see going on in the world. It's the exercise like Pacific Pathways. It's the work that we're doing with allies on interoperability in, in Europe in particular. So the idea is we now have a framework, a place to come with these lessons to impose better order on those lessons, and then the final step, let's do something about it, right? How do we bridge that into implementation? So, so uh, I think all, all of us are, are really excited about the prospects of the Army operating concept as a starting point, a starting point for a focused and sustained campaign of learning under Force 2025, and delivering the best possible Army. You know, there's a lot of talk about innovation, and, and so innovation is a, is a, is a principle, it is a, a tenant now uh, in the Army operating concept. But innovation for what? In our role, I think, as TRADOC, and what we're tra helping to develop the future force, is to deliver the, the greatest combat capability to our force in the shortest amount of time under the available resources. And so that's what we're focused on. How do we do that better as an institution? Uh, and, and of course, working with, uh, with our, our leadership across the services and the joint force. So thank you, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to whatever discussion you'd like to have. Thanks, okay. Mark. Great, thank you. Um, I forgot to mention, although it was quite evident in his remarks, as it always is, and you did actually bring it up, that I forgot to talk about the fact that you're a PhD in history and, uh, and, a, and a former professor of history. So you can never forget that, talking to HR very long, and it's... Well, as my I'm advisor, Don Higginbotham, God rest his soul, what a wonderful man at the University of North Carolina. I did have to go to class at the University of North Carolina as well, just for the record. But, but Don Higginbotham said, it, congratulations, you now know more history than you will ever know. That's what he said when I graduated. Uh, <laughs> I well, you've been accumulating it since then, right? So um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, whether you, uh, first, thanks for that great synopsis of the AOC. I think that was the executive summary verbally. Um, it was very useful to have the whole Thing. Uh, and it's great, and it is, it is really good reading. It, for, it, it really is, I'm not kidding. Um, so do you, can you answer now what you think, how an army of 2025 might be different from mm -hmm. the army of today? What, what are sort of the key dimensions, or is that something you're just yeah. kicking off the discovery of? No, I, that's a, it's a great question. And, and you know, we've received some really clear guides at the outset and through this whole process from from General Ordinero, who really led this whole effort. And so what he has emphasized in particular is really how do we develop, how do we develop forces that are capable of operating in these complex environments of persistent danger against adaptive and capable enemies? 
And so the number one priority has been, you know, through General Ordinary's whole time as chief, and it, and it carries through this document, is leader development and education, as well, as well as training. And so what, what we're doing now is, I think, fundamentally different. So I'll give you a few examples. We will never go back to the old, the old way of thinking about uh, analyzing missions that we just have to see ourselves and the enemy in contest context of the terrain and then we're done, right? We have to see ourselves in context of civilian populations and complex political, social, religious, tribal dynamics. And so what we've done is establish this, because you've got to have cool names for all this, the Training Brain Operations Center, the TBOC, uh, down, at, uh, down at TRADOC, which essentially genericizes conflict data from conflicts we've been in and other conflicts and provides that as a training support package for units and for our, our training centers. And so we're able to immerse our units, not just our units, but our staffs and our, our intel uh, structures in, into organizations, into these complex environments to replicate reality as closely as we can, because actually they came from real world I examples. The other things that we're doing is in our training is, is we're building every, things into our training that happen routinely in combat to improve training realism. And what we want to do is, is, uh, is, is and we are doing, is, is changing really the rigor of our leader development and integrating some, some new techniques. So for example, advanced pedagogical techniques involving you know, imp, you know, the application of, of new technologies is part of that uh, under the, you know, the adaptive soldier and leader training environment you know, effort that, uh, that our special forces have headed up and, and that we've integrated into our, all of our schoolhouses. We are emphasizing sort of advanced cognition uh, capabilities under advanced situational awareness training. And we're working on really ways that we can develop in leaders what, you know, what is called naturalistic decision making, right? How do we immerse leaders in very realistic environments in situations that they're likely to encounter so they're developing and so their first battle, their first mission is like their, is their 100th or 500th uh, mission in terms of the reality of what they, they see. So there's a big emphasis. What's different is we're gonna have really what we call in the concept, you know, optimized soldiers, leaders, and teams. Now, some people could argue, hey, can you really optimize human beings and human teams? But I mean, that's the goal is to, is to integrate these capabilities. Now, how do we do that? We think we'll have to assess soldiers differently, right? That we want to, we want to make sure that we understand what are the knowledge, skills, abilities, and attributes we need for soldiers in certain, uh, certain specialties and recruit those soldiers uh, and, 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 help, and get them into those specialties. We think managing that talent, once we have it, we have to do things in a fundamentally different way to build the competencies we need. Uh, if you're looking for documents to kind of describe this, there's, a, there's the Army Leader Development Strategy, and then, for example, at Fort Benning, there's the Maneuver Leader Development Strategy. It's Googleable and clickable on, and you can see it there that, that we look at what, the, what are the competencies we need from corporal to colonel, how do we develop those competencies across a, you know, across a, a, leader's, uh, a leader's career. And so, and then there's also this area of cognitive dominance and advanced cognition, how we can get more out of the brain. This is where we begin to, we want to apply, apply some of the human sciences more to, to our efforts. And then as I mentioned, naturalistic decision making is a key part of it. But then part of it is dealing with the things that you only deal with in combat, right? Uh, which are, are the things that can lead to combat, combat trauma and, and the breakdown of, uh, of uh, you know, moral character or resiliency in, in soldiers and units. So how do we develop resilient soldiers who are capable of operating in these environments? So I think that's something. I mean, I think that emphasis on, 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 uh, on the human dimension is, is really big. I think the other thing that, that, that is, is different is that we are trying to decentralize capabilities further so, so that leaders at very low levels possess capabilities organic inside of their organization or they can access capabilities very quickly to really engage in war, which is a game of rock, paper, scissors, right? That's combined arms operations. That's joint, what we call it now, joint combined arms operations. And so if you have these capabilities, fires, maneuver, engineers, aviation, access to the Trans Air Force uh, and, and, and uh, uh, capabilities, I mean, if, and you can apply them in quick succession, that's what wins wars, wins battles, and helps win wars. So essentially what we want are, is a force that, can, that, that where smaller units can, can hit harder, that they're more mobile, and, and so they can operate more widely dispersed while maintaining mutual support because they can see and fight across wider areas, and they can concentrate rapidly against unanticipated dangers to take advantage of opportunities. And so if you think about the tactics of infiltration, okay, this is not, again, not completely new, right? 
and, and elevate those tactics to the operational and, and, and strategic uh, levels. And so this will involve you know, training and leader development and some material solutions as well to enable a force to do that. And so we're not, we're not, uh, we're not buying into what was in the, in the 1990s for a while. I think uh, we devolved into an idea that really all we needed to do is target enemy organizations from long distance, right? And, and of course, the problem with the land environment, the land environment it does not get penetrated by those technologies as much as the fluid media of the air and maritime space environments. Because on land, you could have tens of thousands of targets, all of which are trying to avoid being classified as such, right? So, you, so there's a higher degree of uncertainty and so forth. So we, we recognize the limits of being able to do this, uh, but I think it, it, some, some of the big things are this joint force capable of joint combined arms operations is defined in the, in the Army operating concept, and then soldiers and teams that are capable of operating in, in these complex and dangerous environments. Okay, thanks. Let me get out to you all for questions. If you could raise your hand and then wait for the mic. Um, let's go here and then here. And other people could just put a finger up so I can see you. Okay. Sir, Christoph McCray, Institute for Defense Analysis. Thank you. Um, you were pushed back and suspended feeling of the HMS uh, man pack radio due to heat, uh, weight issues. Um, <clears throat> so are there other items you plan on addressing in terms of the weight issue as far as the soldier is concerned? Yeah, well, that's a really good point. So remember, it talked about uh, the need to have the appropriate combinations of mobility, protection, and firepower across all of our formations. So what we have done in our approach to combat developments is we try to kind of flip things on our head a little bit. I think for a while we were taking kind of a top-down approach, right? And we were looking at, you know, how do we make our headquarters more capable? How do we get access to more information? How do we display that information more effectively? Well, we've tried to balance that approach. We're not giving up on any of that. But we want to look from the infantry squad back, the scout squad back, right? And how do we provide really overmatch to that squad, right, under, uh, under conditions uh, that, that we anticipate in future combat? So one of, the, one of the key things is every formation, every organization has to be able to conduct fire and maneuver, right? It's just a bit fundamental to what we do as, as, as land forces. To, to enhance that capability in our squad formation, we, we want to lighten the load, right? And so that will restore a greater degree of tactical mobility to our soldiers. And we're doing that in a number of ways. We want light, lighter body armor, but also lighter weapons. I mean, we now have a squad automatic weapon that's prototyped at seven pounds. You know, uh, caseless tapered ammunition is another way to go. You know, they could, and if we develop, you know, and develop more confidence in closed bolt systems for our weapons, that will lighten our, up our weapons considerably. So we we also so so mobility of that squad, and then and then we're also looking at obviously the, the vehicles that carry that slide. And one of the ways to lighten the burden on a, on a soldier is to give him a ride, right? I mean, so so you know, we combat vehicles are are important today, just as they were important in breaking the stalemate in the Western Front in World War I, right? So, so what combat vehicles are we developing that'll, that'll help us get soldiers, you know, who are fresh and, and mobile into the fight under advantageous conditions? And, and, and how do we want to evolve with the striker and, and the, and the uh, infantry fighting vehicle capability in that connection? But then we also want our squads dismounted, you know, to be able to have this overmatch capability. So I don't know if anybody's read the, the outpost, if anybody, has a question about, you know, why should we be investing in the infantry squad? Just read the outpost, right? And what we want is we want to give those squads the ability, and every, every unit in our army should have a firefight ending capability. You, so you make contact with the enemy, you exchange fire, many of us have been in situations like this, and what you want to be able to do is end it, right? I think if, I think if you're in contact with US Army on your chest, those firefights ought to last about 14 seconds, right? Definitely not 14 hours. So the end result of an encounter action with, with a US Army infantry formation ought to be smoke and boots on the other end. So how do we do that? And how do we get more lethality into the squad with shoulder fired weapon systems? We're developing a counter defilade capability for that purpose and, and getting more firepower in, into that squad. For protection into the squad, we think that there's tremendous potential with, uh, with unmanned uh, systems, uh, UAVs, uh, for example, pocket held UAVs, and so what we want to be able to do is be able to check around the corner without walking around the corner, to be able to, to, you know, you get speed of action in war, in combat, by moving rapidly between reconnoitered areas. So how do we extend our ability to conduct reconnaissance through air and ground capabilities uh, that, that, are, that that squad has access to and, and can control? 
Uh, we're also looking at, at, uh, at you know, flying munitions, which extend the range of the, of, the, of the squad and so forth. And of course, access, right? Access through, you know, through, uh, through uh, full motion video of, of really what we can see from as an air ground team and fighting as an air ground team, as a joint air ground team. So it's a, there are a broad range of initiatives associated with the scout squad. You mentioned one of them, which is lightening the squad up uh, to, to give it a, more mobility. Uh, but, but this is part of the broader effort to ensure every formation or army has the appropriate combination of mobility, protection, and firepower. Sydney? Jump here, and then here, and then here, and then back there. And then go over to this side. Hi. Right. Be fast. Yes, ma'am. Uh, General <laughs> Sidney Friedberg, Sydney, Breaking yeah. Defense. Uh, you hit on a lot of interesting technologies here. To what extent does the Army have a role in this new offset strategy the Secretary and Bob Work mm. have highlighted, which is, seems very tied to anti-access area denial, thus to air-sea battle, which you said you know, the Army has a place in as kind of a, I guess, a cruise missile coastal artillery. But to what extent is that you know, sort of the battle going on over the Army's heads, the offset stuff, and to what extent does the Army have a can, what can army, the Army do for offset and what the offset could do for, for the Army? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you bring up a great point. First of all, in this document, you know, we got great help from across the Joint Force in, in writing the document. It was, it was written as a joint document. So one of, the, one of the key things is that we have to recognize, right, that, that the enemy has countermeasures to any single capability in war. And it's when you combine capabilities, joint and combined arms capabilities, you get a differential advantage. As, as an Army officer, I am the biggest advocate for Air Force capabilities. I have never had to look up in the air and say, is, is it friendly or enemy, right? That could be changing though, right? I mean, with the proliferation of UAVs, the proliferation of sophisticated integrated air defense systems and so forth. So we foresee now a greater premium on operating together as a joint force to maintain mutual support with each other. Our Air Force, for example, has driven our air capabilities in all of our forces, uh, our air and, and naval forces in particular, have driven the identifiable fielded forces of the enemy off the open battlefield, right? I mean, show yourself and you're, and you're gonna get smoked, okay? So what that, what that has done is, is it has forced the enemy to take countermeasures, which then make them vulnerable to concentrated action on the ground. And then when you have concentrated action on the ground that places something of value to that enemy at risk, what are they to do? Well, they have to concentrate against it, which then what makes them vulnerable to what? Your air capabilities. So, it's really how do we develop these capabilities together to deal with anti-access area denial, which I, we're, as I mentioned for the Army, we're all for because the Army doesn't get there without the Navy and the, and the Air Force. Uh, but it's really anti-access area denial for what purpose, right? And so I think whenever we see concepts, I think it's always a good idea to judge them, to bounce them against what I believe are these continuities in the nature of war. What does this concept do about political dimension of war and what you have to achieve politically in, in the broad range of sort of plausible and emerging scenarios where we see our vital interests at risk around, around the world. What does it say about the human dimension of war and why people fight? What does it say about war's uncertainty and enemy countermeasures? And what does it say about war as a contest of wills, essentially? And so, so I, think, uh, I think sometimes we can, we can be driven toward developing military concepts without fully considering you know, the, the, the nature of war itself. And, uh, and so I think on the offset strategy, I think we're, you know, we're excited about participating in it and, and, and working on it. I think some of, the, some of the things we ought to recognize is that you know, there's never been any silver bullet. It can't be a silver bullet, right, technology that's gonna deliver any kind of offset or really our ability to sustain a differential advantage over our enemies, right? Our dif differential advantage has always come from combinations of technologies and especially combinations of, technolo of technologies with skilled soldiers and, and teams and airmen and teams and sailors and teams and Marines and, and teams. So, so I think that's important. There's always a countermeasure. So I think one of the flaws we had in the 90s and when we adopted a lot of this hubristic language uh, about, about future war uh, is that we, we said we were gonna leap ahead. We're gonna leap ahead to a new technology that was gonna make future war fast, cheap, and efficient, right? And we came up with words like rapid, decisive operations, right? And words that's tough to, you know, how do you come, go against that? People are going to say, you know, you're for ponderous, you know, indecisive operations, I guess, you know. But it didn't give enough agency and control to the enemy. 
If you stake something can out, can I just ask what, you what's yeah. the difference between rapid decisive uh, operations and a 14 second firefight? Well, because that's not decisive, because you're going to have another firefight. So as General Perkins says all the time, he says war is war is a is, is sort of a series of temporary conditions, right? So on on a rapid slice of operations, essentially it will reduce war to a targeting exercise, and and you could you know you take the Seinfeld or, or you know the George Costanza approach to war. You could just leave on a high note. You can just do a lot of things from standoff range and then say I'm done, you know, and uh, and think that something uh, useful and, and and consistent with your interests would happen. So I, I think that we have to recognize that if you stake out a narrow suite of capabilities or just one capability, your enemy's going to develop countermeasures, right? And so that's why you don't have silver bullets. You have the submarine and the sonar, right? The bomber, the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. And so I think it's very important for us uh, to, to recognize that, uh, that we have to develop a broad range of capabilities, maintain a balanced joint force capability to play this game of rock, paper, scissors. Right, sorry, right, right there in the blue tie. No. Thank you. Sebastian Sprenger with Inside the Army. Um, a two-part question, if I may. The first one is at the beginning you said um, you fight with the army that the people are going to pay for. It appears now, so one could make the argument. I, I stole that from your chief of staff, from the Australian chief of staff of the army. Yes, those are his um, words about a year and a half ago. Um, so <laughs> arguably one could say sequestration has now led to a situation where that's what we're willing to pay for. Sort of philosophically speaking, are you of the school of thought that says you should, as an officer, attempt to counter that? Um, that's the one question. And the other question is more on the hardware side. The Army has previously attempted to build the uh, ground combat vehicle. Now they're calling it, I think, future fighting vehicle. What are your thoughts on what would make this a successful yeah. uh, platform? And is the time for that to, to begin now? Or can you wait? OK. All right. I mean, so, uh, so two good, good questions there. Well, you know, no, nobody elects generals to make policy, right? And so, so the key, you know, that would that would undermine our constitution. So, what you what you need generals to do, and and uh, and this is the chief's role in particular, is to provide best military advice, right? And and then, but and not to cross the line, typically between advice and advocacy of a certain position. I do think, though, in war and really in decisions involving future force capabilities. It's important to talk about like what are the stakes and really what are the variables. Really, what is what are the components of an effective army uh, in the future? And an army that's going to be able to do from the active component, reserve component, what the nation might need it to do. And so there, there is a suite of capability issues. I've talked a lot about these ca capabilities that we think we need in the future for us to be able to accomplish missions as part of joint multinational, you know, interorganizational teams. But there is an issue of capacity, which you're alluding to, right? That what is the size? What does the size of the army need need to be? And that's not my decision, but I think there are certain things that ought to be brought into the discussion. I think that some of the factors to consider for the army and in, in determining the size of the, the total force and and uh, and maybe even the active force in particular, ready land forces, overall, is what are those foundational capabilities that the army provides. I think we, the American public ought to know that. What is the Army doing every day to just establish foundational capabilities that gives our President, Secretary of Defense, and combatant commanders multiple options, right, to shape security environments, prevent conflict. And these are forces that are committed, you know, to deterring conflict. These are forces that are providing in these, 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 uh, these, these capabilities. What are the forces that have to be prepared to go at a, a, no, a moment's notice? And maybe to take a look at those forces that are prepared to go at a mo moment's notice in maybe historical perspective. Even just looking at deployments that were not forecasted or anticipated in any war plans anywhere, you know, even just from the end of the Cold War. And to understand really then what capacity you need to have ready to go in, in times of, of crises. Other, other things to consider are, are what are just the capabilities you need in the institutional army, right, to continue to organize, train, equip, develop leaders, right? What is that, what is that commitment, right? And, 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 and what, is, what does that take? And then you begin to get an appreciation, really, for, you know, for the capacity you need. Today, we have seven uh, of 10 division headquarters deployed uh, overseas uh, in a broad range of, of, of uh, contingency operations uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, for example, uh, to, in, a, in a mission to reassure our allies in Liberia, you know, for example, to provide uh, command and control capabilities for the response to Ebola in Iraq uh, to, to assess the situation there and to work with uh, a 
Iraqis and, and to integrate efforts of, of our joint and multinational team that's coming together there and so forth. So there are all sorts of examples you can just look contemporaneously in terms of demand for, for army forces. And then, of course, the last thing to look at that is typically classified is, is war plans, right, and, and, and what you need for, for certain war plans. So I, I think that the capacity issue is an important one. I'm not the right person to lay out all those numbers and comment on it, uh, but, uh, but I, I think that, uh, that you know, one of the things we have to recognize is once you give up land force capability, it's not super easy to regenerate it, right? I mean, I think especially if you look at the advanced technologies, right, that our soldiers and teams have to master their integration, and then really what we demand of leaders, right? So to, to grow an army, okay, you can grow privates fast, but those leaders, right, those formative experiences they have as sergeants, as squad leaders, as platoon sergeants, as, as company commanders, that give them the knowledge and the confidence to lead soldiers into battle, you, you can't do that over, overnight. So I think a factor that relates to this is, is uh, you know, is, is, is how quickly, you know, forces can be regenerated. Now, we're doing a lot of work to figure out how we can do that faster. We're looking at expansibility. We're looking at a whole broad range of things. You know, to, we're not just accepting status quo. But, uh, but you raise an important issue on capacity. And then the, the final, what was the other question? Future was that? combat vehicle. Future combat vehicle, okay. I think the first step is to acknowledge the need, which we have, and it's, it's still a requirement uh, for a replacement for the Bradley fighting vehicle and a new, and a new, uh, new, uh, new future fighting vehicle, which would, uh, which would have applicability mainly to, uh, to cavalry formations and, and, uh, and infantry uh, formations, combined arms formations. I think we have to recognize that armored vehicles are a key element of our differential advantage over our enemies, right? And one of the things we have to learn, as I talked about, you know, walking backwards into the future, is to look at how important armored vehicles are to recent con and ongoing conflicts today. And, and, uh, and it's important to remember, I think, in, in part, that you know, the armored vehicles were designed to actually defeat the machine gun in World War I. And if you give up that advantage you get with mobile protected firepower, you essentially go back to World War I conditions every time you bump up against anybody with a machine gun. So, so what armored vehicles allow us to do is to conduct fire and maneuver, both mounted and dismounted, in close combat with the enemy. It provides you the ability to close with the enemy uh, and, and, uh, and destroy the enemy in close combat using you know, mobility and, and firepower. So I think making that case is what's important, and we do have a need for it because I think if you project out how long it takes to develop these capabilities, you have the Bradley reaching obsolescence before we field the first you know, future fighting vehicle. So it's not just that one vehicle though, right? It's the range of capabilities in our armored formations. And so what we are looking at, again, is the right combinations of mobility protection and firepower across all formations. In your armored formations, the first priority is to replace the 113. It's a Vietnam-era vehicle. I mean, in, in Iraq, I, I could not let our ambulances leave our operating base because uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq targeted them, and every time they did, it was a catastrophic destruction of our casualties we were evacuating and our medics in those vehicles. So we have to address the vulnerabilities of the, of the, uh, of the M113 across the range of what those vehicles do for us, and that's the armored multi-purpose vehicle. The second key thing is really upgrades across our vehicles to keep them up with, the, with the, uh, the latest stuff. We're looking at infrared radar capabilities, the ability to see the enemy first and, and kill the enemy first, and then increasing the power of our vehicles. I mentioned we've put a lot on our vehicles, but we need to now increase the power of those vehicles to restore their their mobility and also to power our, some of our communications and network capabilities. And then, and so it's these, the, these improvements of the, to the tank and, and Bradley in the, sh in the short term. In the longer term then, it's to, it's to start this future fighting vehicle effort. We have, a, a, we have a, a three kind of types of formations in our Army. For those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, we have armored brigade combat teams which, you know, which give you that overmatch capability uh, over the enemy in close combat. Their advantage is, is the, is the power that they bring, the overwhelming power they bring to the fight in a broad range of environments. Their disadvantage is, 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 is difficult to deploy, although you know, it's two ships, no matter what kind of formation you send, but logistics demand uh, for those formations as well. So we're working on those to, to address what we see as weaknesses in that formation. In the striker brigade combat teams, we have a formation that can deliver large numbers of skilled, tough, courageous infantrymen into the fight and transition into a dismounted fight uh, as, a, as a combined arms team. We want those strikers to, to be upgunned, 
right? We have good optics on the strikers, stri strikers now, but we have World War II weapon system in a lot of cases, you know, for 50 caliber machine guns. And we want to develop a, a, uh, a mobile protected firepower capability for those formations and to support infantry brigade combat teams. Our infantry brigade combat teams can get there fast, low logistics demand, and they can work in very severely restrictive terrain. But they lack mobility and firepower. So we want to develop uh, vehicles uh, for, for, uh, for select uh, infantry brigade combat teams and airborne forces to be able to, to conduct uh, effective reconnaissance capabilities, offensive security capabilities, um, and to be able to move infantry formations behind that security force. That's that mobile protective firepower effort as well as, uh, as, as a vehicle that we are working on called the, the light reconnaissance vehicle, uh, as well as tactical wheel mobility for those for formations. So there are a lot of initiatives that I think are necessary to keep us, to, 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 for us to maintain overmatch capability. And some people say, well, why, you know, why are you really going for overmatch? Well, the reason is in war, you know, each side tries to outdo the other, right? And, and barely winning in war is an ugly proposition, right? Barely winning in any engagement is an ugly proposition. And so what we, what we need to do uh, for us to be effective as an army uh, and, and to accomplish the mission at the lowest cost and, and soldiers' lives in particular is to provide them with those capabilities. Okay, thanks. Go, Harlan. Sure. And then, uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Yeah. HR, great to see you and thank Good you see. for a formidable and powerful intellectual construct. I, I think it's extremely worthy. My question stems from my broader concerns about the future. Um, I think we're going to come into a huge budget problem. Budget deficits over the long term are going up, interest rates will rise, and the inbuilt cost in defense for pay allowances, retirees like me, health care, weapon systems, by the end of the decade are going to, if left unchecked, are going to cause a compression of a fifth, a third, maybe, maybe more. So the question is, are we going to be left with a hollow force reminiscent of the 70s or a smaller active duty force that's ready and able? And if it's the latter, and I think we're going to be forced to choose those, to what degree is a strategy of regeneration and reconstitution and what you suggest today applicable? Can you do it in smaller batches, so to speak? Yeah. Realizing that during World War II, we actually grew colonels and generals in matters of months, if not years. Yeah. We don't want to recreate World War II to do that, but is there a way that we can be able to compress and make what you suggest smaller and, and, and perhaps more streamlined in the event we are forced with cutting our capabilities dramatically, which I think the budget all things being equal, and they never are, is going to mandate. Yeah. Well, I think you raised a number of issues, right? It's, it's really, uh, if, you, if you do need to expand forces quickly, what is the level to do that? And typically, smaller formations, obviously, are easier to regenerate because of a lower level of complexity and, and ability to plug in, you know, to, to larger units that, are, that already exist. Obviously, we have tremendous capability, you know, in, in our National Guard and Reserve, right, which that gives us mobilization. But you're talking about expanding further, right, beyond that and, and what you have to do. So we're looking at a number of options to do that, some ideas on, on how to do that. What are the right size of formations? We know it takes, I mean, if you want to really build a capable brigade combat team from scratch, we know it takes three years because we just did it, right? I mean, it's hard to do that, especially a combined arms formation like an armored brigade, brigade combat team. So. You know, uh, we're, we're, if you have ideas or if anybody has ideas, this is one of our war fighting challenges, right, is, is, uh, is you know, how we, you know, improve our ability to, you know, to mobilize and expand the Army, right, improve our institutional uh, adaptability, ability to do that. Uh, I, th I think that if you look at, at uh, the size of the force historically where it is now, I think you could say that it's already very, going to a very small, very low number. Uh, the budget, I'm not an expert on the budget or anything, and uh, I will tell you, though, that I think it's, there's a broad consensus that, that, uh, that, that severe cuts, you know, in defense still do not solve your deficit problem, you know. So what you would get under severe cuts to defense, I think, I mean, logically, uh, would be still that weakness in the, in the economy associated with uh, the deficit and the, and the growing national debt uh, and, and a weak military along with that. You know, so, so, or a military that doesn't have the capability you need anyway, not a weak military necessarily. So I, I'm not the, the right person, but those are just my thoughts on that, Harlan. And, and uh, you know, I, obviously, you know, I, I, having, having uh, been the beneficiary of the Renaissance in the Army uh, in the 1970s, 
recognizing with that generation of officers did, they gave us this tremendous gift. You know, they gave us a gift of, uh, of an army that was disciplined, uh, that was extremely well trained, that developed its leaders, that was equipped, you know, with the, these overmatched capabilities and knew how to combine arms and, and fight together and integrate joint capabilities. You know, I, I think we, we, we should be careful not to underestimate the cost, right? And the, the cost in, in time and resources and, and potentially casualties if, if, we, if we give up that gift, you know, by, by not uh, providing the resources we need across those key activities, training you know, readiness, modernization, and personnel. Here and then back there, right here. Thank you, General. This is extremely helpful. In a way, you've been making the case that I think the American public so much needs to better understand uh, where we are and where we're going. Catherine Tobin, uh, Commissioner on the United States China Commission. I understood um, your game plan. As you said, Myra, it was very well laid out. Could you tell me how you would take that um, capacity to provide the foundation to the Joint Command right. to an area such as the Pacific Command. Right. And so taking it from the theoretical to a sketch, if you sure. would, right. of that arena with the other forces. Thank okay. you. All right, so a couple things. I could talk about really what's going on right now. You know, we have, you know, we have Army forces committed in, in very large numbers to, to, to the Pacific already, obviously in a very important deterrent role in, uh, in South Korea, but also uh, you know, bolstering and, and uh, allies uh, with China, I mean, in Japan, uh, for, uh, for, exa for example. Uh, and we are, we are developing uh, very good relationships you know, with a number of, of countries in the region, some of, of which, as you know, we, we've not had relationships with uh, in quite some time. And, uh, and we're doing that through an army initiative, in large measure, you call it regionally aligned forces, where we align our, our, our forces to particular regions for a number of, for, for a number of reasons. The first, the first is really to learn more about that region and to learn from our partners, right? I mean, we're not, we're not dispensing knowledge to our allies. Oftentimes, or most often, we gain, we learn more from our allies about the security problems that they face in the region. And then also, you know, their, you know the, how, they, how they fight, how they train. I mean, we, so it's a, it's a really rich relationship that we're developing through regionally aligned forces and understanding you know, the threats to the region. The other thing that we're doing is providing ambassadors and, and uh, a, a sort of more depth of capability in, in, in security force assistance and theater security cooperation. So based on the country plans for, for those ambassadors, those army forces give them the potential to increase cooperation with, with, uh, with, our, with military forces in particular and to do the kind of training that our special forces have always done, but the demand you know, far exceeds the, the, supp the supply. So that's one way is through regional engagement of forces and developing of those relationships, theater security cooperation, and then the development of a theater security architecture where you have army forces that provide logistics capabilities, uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities, intelligence uh, infrastructure and capabilities throughout the, the Pacific as, as well. Now, in terms of operationally, well, it's it's a development of relationships and the developments of, of capabilities consistent with with how our ambassadors uh, and and, you know, and the regional bureau of state and others see our see our objectives there. So, we're not it's not the army just charging around you know looking for people to partner with. I mean, this is all part of a plan to you know to develop an effective theater security architecture. And then if you think about Army role, the Army's role, Marine Corps' role, Land Force's role in the Pacific, I think, again, you know, this is where history is instructive, right? Uh, if, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, Japan's actions in, in, in World War II, I think you can see that, that uh, there was a huge element of a land campaign there. So if there was to be a regional threat emerging from Asia, that threat would have a very significant land component to it. And then obviously operating on and controlling land allows you to project power from land into the, the maritime, air, and space domains, uh, which is another role, I think, of, of land forces. The key thing I think land forces help do, you know, if you want to do something negative or punitive, it, it, a first choice oftentimes can be standoff capabilities. 
if you need to do something positive, right? Reassure an ally, deliver you know, humanitarian assistance to the people in need, it, to do something, po develop a relationship, right, based on mutual trust and common interests and common purpose and respect and so forth, you have to do that kind of close up on land oftentimes, and that's, that's what Army forces provide you with. Thank you. Thank you. In the back, back there, and then we'll come up here. Good afternoon, sir. Retired Colonel Chris Holshek. My question is with regard to looking at three capabilities areas, if you would, in terms of the AOC, but also in terms of how TRADOC looks at developing and sustaining these three areas. One is civil affairs. The second is the reserve component. And the third is multilateral engagement. Okay, so uh, for civil affairs, I think civil affairs is, is more important than ever, right? And, and I think that if you look at the long history of civil affairs, when we decided to, you know, to, give, to, to not focus as much on military support to governance and, and rule of law is when I think we lost some of our advantages within that particular specialty. So there's a new center stood up at Fort Bragg that, that is looking at, at that and how to evolve the civil affairs force. And those are going to be the keepers of our expertise in this particular area. And then you know, some, some, one of the counter arguments to this will be, hey, we, we're just not going to do that anymore, right? We're going to sort of opt out of, of, of that mission set for the Army. But I think really what that, that misunderstands two things. First of all, the Army's always had to do these types, types of missions, right, to consolidate gains. And it's not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it was after the Panama invasion, after, after the Dominican Republic intervention in 1965. I and mean, just to pick any example, right, you've always had to conduct military support to governance and, and rule of law and development activities. So we ought to be ready to do that because we're, we're likely to have to do it again in, in the future. So we have to have the expertise there, but we need that expertise across our force as well, that kind of expertise. So we're looking now, what are the, what are the skill sets that we need in our different military operational specialties? So if we develop in our military police, just now military policing skills, shouldn't we add on, based on our, our recent experiences, certain investigative skills that will allow them to advise military commanders like the Gendarmerie, French Gendarmerie, or the Italian Carabinieri do to their de deployed forces? Shouldn't we give them the skills that they need to help us gain visibility of organized crime networks associated with our enemies and help us see flows through those networks of people, money, weapons, narcotics, and, and, and so forth? Shouldn't they also be, have, be able to advise you know, local police forces and so forth? So I think that's a skill set that we ought to inc improve across our army, like for example, just in one specialty, for engineers. Shouldn't engineers be able to assess infrastructure as well and have some of the civil affairs skills associated with that? In terms of your final one, you know, in terms of multilateral engagement, I think that's a skill set that we need across our, our whole force, you know, which, you know, which uh, includes, I think, you know, some different leadership skills that we have now built in to, again, this leader development program. If you go to the Maneuver Leader Development Strategy, there's an annex on language and, uh, and culture and so forth. One of the key skills that we're emphasizing is cross-cultural negotiation and mediation. And it's essentially applying what we know from negotiation mediation theory to military missions, right? And you know, what's the first step? Well, interest mapping. I mean, understand the interests of the people you're dealing with. I mean, this is, of course, quite relevant to, I mean, Iraqi security forces or, you know, Libyan security forces such as they are. Or, other, you know, who, who, are, who am I dealing with? What are their interests? What is or the degree PPBS. to which their interests sorry. or PPBS or PPBS, right? <laughs> or any of those exactly? <laughs> or processes. And what was your second one again? Uh, reserve. Reserve component. Okay. One, one of this is one of our war fighting challenges. But really, what the war fighting challenges allow us to do is integrate our reserve component into every one of these war fighting challenges. So what we want to do is we don't want to do we don't look at balance sheets. Like how many in the reserve? How many? That, that. What are the capabilities that we need to have? based on some first order principles for, for, for future force design. Now, these, we took a cut at these first order principles, which are, again, in Annex B of the, of the uh, operating concept. And, and one of those is, is to, to, to really match the capabilities with the, the component to make sure that the component, this is active guard or reserve, right, it has uh, that, 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 that um, capability is consistent with their strengths, right, the strengths of that component relative to the others. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have L certain capabilities in all three components, maybe, like the logistics capabilities we have or port opening capabilities and so forth and, 
uh, and our, our joint logistics over the shore and our Army watercraft, for example. I mean, but, but do you have the, the bulk of that capability in the component who, who has, you know, the, who has the, uh, um, the, the best competency and ability to sustain that competency over time? So there's not an easy, you know, simple question of where we're going with reserve component. The idea is that we're going to have evolve all the, the capabilities of all the three components based on these kind of, of these first principles and a sustained effort working on the war fighting, war fighting challenges. And so what we won't do and, and is we won't develop, you know, as an, as an active component, you know, solutions for the reserve and guard and then say, hey, what do you think of this? What we have now is we have a, a method and a system and a framework where everybody is in on that conversation from the framing of the problem. I think one more question. You have time sure. for one more. I think we had one right up here. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Neil Smith, uh, also had the privilege of replacing your Fox Troop in Talafar uh, in 237 Armor years ago. Um, Jesse one Sellers. Day, yes, from Jesse Sellers. I mean, it's at the so Granary. sad. I mean, obviously, what's going on in Iraq. I mean, this is no kidding story. Iraqi families were naming their children after this troop commander uh, in, in, uh, in Talafar, you know, which is, which is now besieged by by these bastards, uh, ISIL. So, it's always yeah. tough to rip a company commander. It's got kids walking down the street chanting his name. That's, that's a difficult task, but uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about, though, was uh, Unified Quest results from last year. About a year ago, your predecessor, Fred Arkick, uh, published a uh, unclassified paper that outlined sort of the Army's results of Unified Quest, and I personally found them very uh, much at odds with what you've recently been talking about. It was very technologic uh, technologically oriented. Uh, it basically, as I had to summarize it, would be a Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first or last concept without really putting it in a, a strategic context. It had all sorts of learning domain implications that were basically fanciful and tied together with Malcolm Gladwell quotes. Are we walking back that, or how do you see the AOC potentially uh, simpl uh, supplanting that? No, I mean, I think, I think all that work is, is relevant and useful. So what we've been able to do is place that work into a broader context, right, to understand the possibilities associated with each of these initiatives, but also limitations and how they have to fit in, how they have to fit in to, 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 to deliver on these first order capabilities, to, to develop answers to these first order questions, right? So one of, the, one of the problems that we've had, I think, in the past is we would, uh, we would look at things, and it, there's advantages to this too, I mean, but there, we would look at things by war fighting functions. So we categorize what we have to do in war by maneuver and fires and intelligence and sustainment, right? And so, what, what we did is we artificially separated those things which have to be routinely combined in combat and on missions, any mission. And so what we are, are doing and forcing now, and everybody's enthusiastic about it, I mean, it's, but it's uncomfortable at first, is to work outside of each of those cylinders of excellence, right? And, and to work together in the sustained manner on what the Army has to do, right? And, and, uh, and so an example, okay, an example of a war fighting challenge is how do we develop and sustain a high degree of situational understanding in complex environments and against adaptive enemies? I mean, is that a problem we're just gonna be able to solve quickly tomorrow? No. Is there, oh, is there some sort of one single technological capability that's gonna deliver that situational understanding? No. So, but there's a broad range of capabilities you know, can help us understand better combined with leader development, combined with training, combined with developing organizations that are capable of, of doing that, combined with you know, the cross-cultural uh, uh, capabilities we want to cross our, our force, you know, combined with uh, the application of human sciences and, and the effort at advanced cognition and, and naturalistic decision-making, combined with, you know, so, I mean, it, it's not any one solution. So what we're doing under each of these warfighting challenges, we define the problem, right, and what is the problem we're trying to solve, what is our assessment of how well we can do that with what's called the base force, the force that's budgeted, and then we make a grounded projection into the future beyond that. What are the, again, in these four, in really five key areas, okay, we look at, at, uh, at, at really the enemies, threats, adversaries in the operating environment, the mission, technology, mission, what we're learning you know, today and from history and so forth, and then finally, we, we look at an area called assets and opportunities. What, what do we have right now in the force, right, that we have an opportunity to, to combine in a different way and to do things differently with, right? So, so uh, I think what you might have seen in, in that document, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, are sort of a series of discrete sort of initiatives without maybe a clear understanding of how those initiatives would lead to a improved overall capability for the Army in the future. And that's what we're trying to do by starting with the conceptual foundation, 
having a framework for analysis, a sustained campaign of learning, and then, and then a clear bridge into implementation. Okay. Sir, I think, I think you've got another engagement. I think everybody here would be happy to stay, um, but we've kept you longer than we promised. It's always great to have you That's here. Great. Uh, we hope Pretty you come beautiful. back soon. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much. And thanks for the great work that CSI has done. Thanks, thanks really a lot. Appreciate it.